This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. My guest today is best-selling author Kat Timp, whose new book is I Used to Like You Until... Dot, 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 How Binary Thinking Divides Us. In a totally insane political season, this just might be the most important book of the year. I talk with Kat, who co-hosts the super popular Gutfeld Late Night Show, about why she finds it easier to tell people she works in pornography than at Fox News, what it's like being libertarian at a conservative network, and how she gets people to engage one another rather than vilify one another. This podcast was taped in front of a live audience in New York City. Go to reason.com slash events to get tickets to our next Reason Speakeasy. Here is the Reason interview with Kat Tim. Thanks for talking. Thank you so much for having me. You are um, also pregnant. We're going to talk yes. about that. Is, and is this a divine intervention or? No, I had yeah. sex. Okay. <laughs> but did you have sex or did you have IVF? I had. I, it, I got pregnant the sex way. But after doing IVF. But no. Right? So you know what's so weird is I, I did. I froze embryos. Yeah, you have frozen embryos. We, we have embryos. nine frozen embryos. Okay. And uh, I was told by a doctor that I probably would need drugs to bring me up to at least a 10% chance yeah. of getting pregnant. So I thought that was true. Okay. <laughs> and I was, just good I was just living my life. Yeah. And, and, and then I just like didn't feel good one so day. So you did the IVF and then you got pregnant anyway. Yeah, I just froze right. the kids. You know, cause... it's good. Yeah, because if Trump wins, you'll never be able to access those kids <laughs> or... We will all be paying for them. It's kind of confusing. I'm, yeah, I'm right? not it's sure. Like at this point. Yeah, I've heard both. I've heard that I'll yeah I'll never see them again, yeah. or you guys have to start paying for them. Okay, well we'll know, figure it out. Um, let's start with the book. Uh, I used to like you until dot dot dot, mm -hmm. and then it's about how binary thinking divides us. Um, is there a specific anecdote when you realized, you know? Did somebody say that to you in a particular way or did you think about that of like, I just can't stand this person because they are not my tribe? I think it just happens to me in my life constantly because I'm an independent. I'm not a member of either major party, but I also work on air at Fox News. So I will get shit from the viewers because I'm not conservative on certain issues, or if I criticize Trump, they call for me to be fired, so on and so forth. But then there's people on the other side who don't even want to talk to me at all because they're like, oh, you work at Fox News, so that tells me everything I need to right. know Right, and you, you talk about in the book how you would tell people at parties that I work in pornography. Porn, yeah. Yeah. I, because that that facilitated better conversations. People would be like, that's, that's so cool. Person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know those people you're talking to at a party where it's like, ugh, you're stuck talking to them for a little bit, but you know you'll never see them again? When they're like, what do you do for work? I say porn. And they're like, oh, cool. And then we move on. Yeah. Because um, they don't want to seem judgmental. Or sometimes when people ask me what I do for work, I'll simply say, I've also said, um, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, um, what is the worst uh, response that you remember when you're, or, you know, yeah, I'm on, I, I'm a commentator on Fox News. Literally all of them are the worst. Yeah. They're all the worst because they start projecting every single yeah. opinion that they have about Fox News onto me. Right. And it's just so, it, I, I mean, I had, um, I wrote, a, or I had a piece out about me and about the book in Variety. And I was so excited about it coming out. Um, it was a great piece. Um, and all the viewers or all the like the the readers of Variety were very pissed that they had done a piece of me and all because I work there. And it, it's mm -hmm. just it just blows my mind, especially because sometimes the people that'll be saying it to me, I'm like, don't you work at a fucking bank? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. The, what 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 makes you so it's just so because Fox is a platform. It's an yeah. idea. It's not it's not an idea. It's an a platform on which to share ideas. Yeah. And you do realize that if I weren't on Fox, if any everybody who there was nobody who wasn't MAGA on Fox, then your grandparents who leave it on all day would never hear from anybody who wasn't MAGA. Right. And do you really think that that's better? And also working there, I do have people in my I know in my real life who are my friends who are very MAGA. Right. And I ha like they're not monsters, you know. I mean, we disagree, but. That doesn't mean that there's nothing we can agree on or we have, have no common ground anywhere. Have you ever had the experience where you're at, uh, you know, something like the Met Gala 
Uh, which I'm not I assume, invited yeah. to stuff like that. But uh, well, let's say a liberal yeah. event, okay? Yeah. Uh, and um, you know, people come up and it's like, oh, thank you for working at Fox News. Like, do, uh, you, have you seen I, kind of the Benedict Arnolds uh, of the progressive left at all? I mean, some pe- people sometimes will have questions and they'll make statements like that. It's more about I'll hear from people after I make a certain statement that mm-hmm. I know is going to piss off viewers, and I and I get it because I do sometimes piss them off, and. I could sell, I know, because most people, I don't know if you guys know this, most people that watch Fox News are MAGA. Like a lot of them are big Trumps like their dude. And so I know that I could sell more books. I could sell out all my shows, sell tickets to my shows faster if I said the stuff that I knew and only the stuff that I knew people watching we're going to like. Right. So I get there's that temptation for that. But I just, I truly can't bring myself to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, I, but I think that that's something that a lot of, it can be hard to see a lot of that shit. Yeah. It can be frustrating, but I don't know how you'd sleep at night any other way. How do you, how do you, uh, keep yourself from doing it? I mean, okay. You, so you want to sleep. So yeah. you're like, okay, I'm going to be honest to myself, but isn't it hard? Like when you're in an environment where all of yeah. the pressure is in one direction, mm-hmm. like how do you, how do you make sure that you're staying with one foot in reality or something? Yeah. I mean, I guess I just think of it as when it's as much as it sucks to get shit from people, at least when I get shit from people, I know that it's because I at least stood up for something that I believed in. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine getting shit from people and I'm just been grifting the entire time. I could not possibly imagine. So you were not going to get any of that tenant media money, right? That (laughs) the Russian government was funneling in. No, no foreign government has ever offered me anything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have that to look forward to, (laughs) I I guess. Um, You know, you start the book and you, and you close it as well with a quote from John Updike, uh, one of his rabbit novels where, um, you're, and you're talking about the main character, or it's uh, a line about the main character that says, hate suits him better than forgiveness, which is kind of a theme of the book, mm-hmm. right? That binary thinking both divides us, but it's also more comfortable from where yeah, people, right? I, Can you talk about that? Yeah, I talk about hate as a shelter, right? Um, that's what, what he talks about. And it, it, it really, hate really can be a shelter for a lot of people because... If there's just these two sides and the other side is bad, then you get to be good just because you're not on that side. You don't actually have to do oh, anything. It's like you were watching a presidential debate last night or something. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It was I it was actually kind of boring. I couldn't really it was not I mean, it was boring. It was. What did you want to happen that didn't happen in the presidential debate? To, for it to keep For them to kiss or something? It, or Honestly, it was their first time meeting. Wouldn't it be funny if they did? Oh, yeah, yeah. You see, like, the <laughs> gleam in their eyes. Yeah, what if they were like, no, you on. be president. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they were, it was, it was, I feel like the, honestly, both sides set the bar so low for yeah. the other one. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. like, liberals were like, what if Trump is just, like, calls her a bitch? <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And then conservatives were like, well, she's not going to be able to form a sentence. That's and right. obviously, without she, giggling, she formed all yeah. of her sentences and didn't giggle at all. Yeah. So I think that they did a disservice to themselves by setting the bar solo for her in particular. Right. But it just was like a kind of boring. I mean, I, I don't, I, I fell asleep several. I mean, I actually, <laughs> I fell asleep before it and I woke up throughout. <laughs> Because I'm like I'm pregnant. And you I'm were tired. like I'm having a miscarriage, it, yeah, right? And I'm so, like saying this. Well, because I was tired. Listen, I had to wake up so early. Book promotion's hard. It's even harder when you're pregnant. I got up so early, so by, I got up at four a.m. So by seven p.m. yesterday, I was just crying for no reason. Right, right. Like, then the debate started, yeah, and, and I was you, like, I needed then to go, you had reasons. To I need, cry. yeah, I needed to go to bed. Yeah. But I also so there is um, research I write about in my book that. If, and this is so obvious, they shouldn't even had to research it, but moral outrage is more often rooted in self-interest than it is in altruism. So the study found that the more or the, the less power that people have or feel that they have over a problem, the more motivated they are to direct their outrage about the problem at someone else, and then the better they feel when they do. The problem is that doesn't actually do anything to solve anything, and we've actually divided us even further. So how uh, how do, how does that play out with a particular issue? Then say like, can you take a, a kind of right wing tribalist? Mm-hmm. What do they not feel like they have control over that they project outward and then do the same for somebody on the left? Well, I think one of the 
the most interesting issues that I write about, and this is for both sides, is the climate. Mm-hmm. And the fact that that's relatively new to be a divisive issue. And it shouldn't be really. Like, don't we all want clean air and we also want economic prosperity? But it be, it became... That's dangerous thinking. But it's crazy. We should be able to have both. And it wasn't until, I mean, probably, you know, the Kyoto Protocol that it became kind of split. That's relatively new. And it's crazy to think about it now because now it's like you say one thing about how maybe even this- you calling it climate change oh yes so you've, that's you, to, you're yes. you klaus schwab's minion or something of right? course but yeah. it's it's to me it doesn't seem that controversial that what you put into anything whether it's the environment or not it's going to affect the thing that's just kind of how actions work. and uh, you're talking about being pregnant right <laughs> yeah, yeah that's how yeah. that is how it happens yeah <laughs> Um, but also that, that it should be some of the stuff asking how much does this cost right, is right. also that's some of the things that people are proposing. They'll actually will, it will the, the cost benefit just isn't there. But that doesn't mean that you don't think it's real. So I think that but it, that what that's something that definitely and people feel powerless some, over. Yeah, right? right. Because like individuals can't really do that much mm-hmm. to affect climate change. And even like if the U.S., Right, changed exactly. everything then you know india and china you know if they keep doing whatever they're doing it doesn't exactly matter, right? mm-hmm. um why um you know we definitely i mean by all kind of polling measures and stuff like that we're more polarized than we used to be yeah um and you know all of these weird kind of side questions of like you know would you let your children marry somebody from another political party yeah um what's driving that um is it that we feel less powerful over things that matter in our life increasingly or you know why are why are we more binary in our thinking now than you know we were 20 or 40 years ago yeah i think a lot of it does have to do with you know it's finding that i it becomes such a part of your identity but also i think that we've gotten to a point now where if you don't pick a side people you know you have to kind of people there's so much pressure that you have to because it's like if you're not on my side, then my side's the side that is going to save the country. And then you're on the side that's going to destroy the country. And also, I think people are afraid. I think it's a very effective tool, fear. Uh, Politicians are very good at using it. The media is very good at using it, where it's a lot more motivating to be um, on a side if you're saying the other side, if that guy wins, then the whole world is going to crash and burn. So if you if that's what you believe, and people do believe this, people on both sides do believe this. If you believe that, then you would obviously want to stop at nothing for your side to win. If the literal, if literal civilization is what's at stake here, that makes it a lot easier. And I also think we don't really see each other as human anymore. In a lot of instances, I, I know think, I don't see myself as human. Well, it's tough. I don't recognize myself in the mirror anymore. I'm like, who's that fat girl in my yeah, house? No, that's <laughs> right, yeah. And it's only going to get fatter from here, that's from what right, I've Googled. Yeah. And that's what the, yeah, and then it never, you never lose the baby weight. I think I every woman, I can speak for every woman in this room who's had a child, you never lose the Oh, baby. I'll just, yeah, no, I'm yeah. going to stop eating. What, so. What's the role of... Um, <laughs> just kidding. What's the, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. What's the role of... We don't judge, yeah. you know, it's like... Uh, but... Uh, What's the role of the media in increasing polarization? And, you know, a lot of people talk about how a a platform like Fox News, when it started, you know, it was always polemical, but it was not as extreme as it was. And MSNBC went through a bunch of different iterations before it became this kind of super woke thing. I mean, is... Is the polarization being driven by the media or is the media reflecting our polarization? Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably a very difficult thing to answer. But I do think it's interesting when people attack specifically Fox News as if there aren't those things that exist on the other side. Right. I think that part of it has gotten worse, again, because of social media, all the hate that you'll have to actually see. You people didn't used to have to, to hear that. Like people didn't used to have to get off TV and be like, hear from all these people about how you're a piece of shit. And like, it's never just like, I disagree. That was, you know, in a simpler America, that was your family did that. Yeah. Right. You didn't need strangers. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And it's always so personal. Like you're disgusting. Like, I mean, I have people whose entire fucking profiles is just shitting on me over and over again. 
I do well, like the power you know, that I yeah. have over their lives. Yeah, I mean, you're very important to them. Then, <laughs> they, right? yeah. they, it's 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 a lot of retired women in their 70s that oh, are like that the right? ones. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're just triggered by the fact that I'm still breathing. It's And really, are they, do they, are your worst um, kind of enemies online or your detractors, do they tend to be, are they progressives or are they conservatives who feel somehow spurned by you? Both. Yeah. Both. I get a lot. A lot of the the women are like, you know, you're not conservative, and I'm like, when did I say that I was? Right. I've never said that I was. My my skirts are too short, or you know, it's just. But you can never please some people. Like I, everyone used to say I was like disgusting and old, and I understood nothing about the world because I was childless. And then I got pregnant, and two days after I announced it, these same people were like, "Will you shut the fuck up about being pregnant?" <laughs> There's more to life than just being pregnant. And I'm like, you know, I'm almost starting to think that this isn't really about me. Yeah. yeah. I'm starting to think that this might just be like, like, whose grandma is this? Like, will somebody please take her out to lunch? You know? And so you can't worry about it. But I really do think that that's part of it. I think that people can, they can notice that they get these careers and they get these platforms. And they're like, well, I don't want to upset my platform because then it's going to affect my bottom line. And I think that applies more to just media, though. I think that applies to Hollywood. I think that applies to, to, to everybody, really, who has some sort of public role or even corporations. Like Uber needs to every Pride Month have the cars be little rainbow flags. Why? Like, do you know what I like? Or why do you not love gay people year round or yeah. what? No, it's, they get one month. They get one yeah. month. I mean, yeah. it's it's just and blacks, of course, get the shortest month. And if they did, and if they didn't have the rainbow, would that really mean something about how they feel? I mean, I just feel like so much of this is driven by that. And but, but I, don't, I feel like most people understand that, but they don't think about it on, in their day to day interactions or consumption of media. And not to say that there aren't. I know people who I work with who just they love Trump. They do. They just truly, they're not pretending to love Trump. They just like, that's my, they'll watch videos of them and they're smiling. They love that dude. And like, good for you. I wish that I could feel that way. My life would be easier. My well, life would be so much easier. It's because you're libertarian, right? Yeah. You, you always have to be, but wait, you know, like you can't yeah. enjoy yourself fully. Yeah. Well, people be like Trump for free speech. I'm like, okay, but he just said that he wants to throw you in jail for a year for flag burning. Right. That's, yeah. <laughs> That's not pro-free speech that you can't purchase a flag and burn your own flag. Come on, flag. but we're in a war for civilization, so it, you exactly, should not dissent. Exactly. That's such an important political protest. That's what the First Amendment is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about truly about being able to protest the government without government retaliation. It's not so much about memes. The memes, too, are you should be protected, but... Of course, you can't be pro-free speech and against that, against or, uh, for that, for prosecuting that. Before we continue with the Reason interview, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Z-Biotics. This is a game-changing product that you can use before a night out. Do you think you need to make a choice between having a great night or a great next day? Z-Biotics might make a huge difference for you. Z-Biotics pre-alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in your gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme that breaks this byproduct down. All you have to do is remember to make Zbiotics your first drink of the night and then drink responsibly. Try it out and see a difference the next day. I don't drink, but I'll tell you what, a friend of mine who does recently cracked open Z-Biotics when we were out, and I said, hey, does it work? She told me, yes, it really works. Go to zbiotics.com slash T-R-I to get 15% off your first order. Use that code, zbiotics.com slash T-R-I at checkout. T-R-I stands for the reason interview. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money without asking any questions. Once again, head to zbiotics.com slash TRI and you're going to get 15% off at checkout. Now, back to the Reason interview. 
you talk uh, in a, a couple of chapters about kind of online speech and things like that. And it's weird, isn't it, that both the right and the left, at, depending on the day of the week yeah. or what blood sugar level they're at, they yeah. will be like, let's, you know, we have to shut down social media. We yes. have to regulate it or control it. Um, where is that coming from? Is it just situational ethics of like, we, we need to shut something down because it's harming us? Or? Yeah, it's using fear to manipulate. And yeah. I, just uh, for example, I mean, I, I'm, I'm my first book that I wrote was a very passionate defense of free speech. Mm -hmm. I have maintained that point of view. I am a First Amendment absolutist. And both sides at times believe that they're First Amendment absolutists, depending on what's in the news. And after... For for so long, I think it was conservatives really were kind of had the the leg up on liberals when it came to free speech, and then it kind of sort of there that was going away in some instances. Whether it um, is some of Ron DeSantis's legislation, which I write about, where I'm like, guys, the Stop Woke Act. If you think whether you regardless of whatever you think of woke thought and speech whatever how, whatever that means to you 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 can't deny that that is thought and speech and this is the government trying to ban instruction whatever that means of certain thought you shouldn't stand for that right because they could do the same thing within conservative thought and speech and then i get in return after i present this well-reasoned argument that makes sense and it's the exact argument that i used when it was speech that they wanted out there then i get called a, a pedophile right, right? yeah <laughs> it's not like and oh i disagree usual, it's like why do you want to talk about sex stuff with yeah. kids you pedophile yeah no the, the why are you like the real the answer is somewhere in between you're a little bit of a pedophile <laughs> and a little bit of a it's free speech just the, the, with the ease i mean for all this time and conservatives were right to be just because i you know I'm not a Nazi because I think this, this. And then it's like, it's flips. Okay, you're not a pedophile if you want free speech in this instance either. And it's, it is, it's, it's easier to think that you're like a warrior for children than just like somebody with a different opinion. But really, you're just somebody Do with you, a different and opinion. One of, your, one of your chapters, which is very good, is, is titled in quotes, Think of the Children. Um, yeah. Because then this, you know, this was so over the top in the 90s. I know when I, started writing at Reason, the Simpsons had a character who would just show up and apropos of nothing would say, think of the children. Yeah. Because that was the way that conservatives and liberals just shut down any conversation. Do you think having a child, will that make you be like, no, don't think of the children, oh. or think of the children even less than you do now? Yeah, no, I, I, I do want my child to be raised by a drag queen. Yeah, <laughs> okay. okay. No, uh, this, at, she least also, at least, par at least she, partially. Yeah, she has a chapter called Drag Queen Saved My yeah. Life, which we'll get to in a but, second. No, I, I get asked that a lot. I, I get also emailed that by conservatives. In all seriousness, I get emails from conservatives like, well, maybe now you'll come over to the correct side now that you're having a child. And I'm like, what does that mean exactly yeah. to you? You know, like... I also am going on tour um, all the way through the middle of December. So I'm giving myself exactly a month and a half to figure out how to be a mom. And I feel like that is going to be plenty of time. I'm focusing first. I'm going to learn how to hold the baby. Mm -hmm. If someone handed me a baby right now, I'd be like, I'm not the right person for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have you ever held a baby? Uh, um, an infant I held or? a baby... A baby human, um, I, not a, baby, not a kitten or a I, chimp or anything. The last baby I held was... Megan McCain's first baby in 2020. Okay. And it was after several hours of being like, it'll be okay, cat. <laughs> you can yeah. hold the baby. Because you don't want to like ruin it. Right. That's right. It's going to be so weird when mm -hmm. the baby comes out of me and like lives mm. in my apartment. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because I don't know, like I just can't imagine when when it comes out and they give the baby to me in the hospital and I'm the, the and they leave, I'll be like, I don't have a license for this. It's fucking weird. Do you think you should need a license? Should the government license parents? No, they couldn't do it anyway. There's like nobody crackheads. Crackheads are always constantly having babies. Yeah, like you can't. What are you gonna do? Some about of them work out pretty well. Right? They do. Yeah, yeah. So kids crackheads are resilient. Crackheads have very successful yeah. kids sometimes. Yeah. Um, what about the drag queens? How uh, explain how drag queens saved your life yeah so i i get into the the nitty gritty in this chapter of a horrific abusive relationship that i was in in my mid to late 20s and it, it you know i go into great detail about it it was mentally abusive emotionally abusive at times it was physically abusive mm. and then 
the way that that a relationship like that continues is the person has got mind control over you a little bit, or I think that this is all my fault, and I think um, no one would ever want me other than this person, and with this, you know, he became the be all end all, horrible, horrible, horrible. When it finally ended for good, um, I remember going to a drag show with one of my friends, and there was a dance contest, and I and I won. Um, because I'm like so bad, I think, <laughs> you know, like there's the world's ugliest dog competition. Yeah, that's right. It's a worthwhile spectacle because of how ugly the dogs mm -hmm. are. That's kind of how I dance. So it was a pity win. Yeah. Well, no, no. I mean, it was more like what, what is, how is, what is her body doing? Yeah. You know? Um, and I just felt, I just looked at the drag queens just being so unapologetically themselves. I also mm -hmm. think drag queens are kind of the living, that, that helped me get through it. I would think back to that when I was going through these horrible times and I lost myself. I don't think that drag queens are a living embodiment of so many things I believe in. Um, what I wrote about a lot in my first book of just like nothing is sacred right. and decorum is highly overrated and we, we should fly in the face of it and self-expression being an, such an important form of at times protest but oftentimes connection. I have been very pro and love drag queens for mm -hmm. so many years and I've talked about it openly on Fox and it's never been a problem until it suddenly became a problem around 2022. Yeah. What, what explains that? Because, um, you know, suddenly drag queens became a big, big deal. Yeah. Suddenly they did become a big deal. And I, I actually went back when I was doing research for my book and I searched clips of myself when I talked about drag on Fox. And then I looked I, I corresponded with my Twitter mentions at the same time. And for a while it was nothing or people be mm -hmm. like, ha ha ha, nothing. And then all of a sudden it was, you should be fired why do you want to molest kids? Like extreme, like I bet your husband is ashamed of you. Like mm -hmm. really no. extreme stuff. And I think, you know, I, it was around the time when there was the debate over schools and what should be teaching in schools. And mm -hmm. then of course, nothing can ever just stay on the thing. And then right. it became all of a sudden now drag queens are a symbol of the left and that's what happens with this binary thinking. It, it's you stop thinking because once you pick a side, mm -hmm. all the thinking's been done for you. You just go along with whatever their side's saying, and people have knee jerk reactions to oh drag queen, oh that's a liberal yeah. thing, so that's bad. Drag queen equals groomer, that's bad. Just like how people on the left will hear oh Fox News, therefore she's bad. Right. It's people aren't actually thinking about these things. I mean, the drag ban in Tennessee it's illegal for there to be a drag performance that could harm children anywhere a child could be. A child could be literally anywhere, you know? And I don't think of all the things I worry about for my child, even if I didn't love drag queens as much as I do, the like, oh, they're going to see a dude on with lipstick somewhere. Like there's a scarier shit out in the world than a man who looks fabulous. Um, yeah. You um, you talk uh, either in that chapter or a related one about how, okay, so you're pro-drag queen and you don't think drag queens are groomers uh, and they're not turning kids gay or anything Many like that. Many of them don't give a shit about your kids either way. Yeah. yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, but then you also talk, you know, in a way that seems sensible about like school uh, laws where um, school districts will not tell parents if their kids are transitioning or, or, or they're being treated differently at school than the parents expect. And you say that's wrong. Totally. Um, and while you're very pro-trans uh, rights and, and even transitioning for certain people, like why is that? I mean, that seems so obviously sensible. Mm -hmm. Why is that, you know, why, why aren't more people in that camp? Because... Because people, because of the binary thinking, because mm -hmm. of the two sides, because they think, oh, these are, this is for trans kids. This is helping mm -hmm. out trans kids. So if you don't support this, then you're transphobic. And what if the kid is being abused at home for being trans and so on and so forth? And what I talk about repeatedly in the book is if you feel really emotional about an issue or if an issue is really contentious, the best thing to do is to take that piece out of it for a second and then look at it. Because what you're saying here is that teachers should be not telling parents. They should be keeping secrets about kids from parents. 
that is that's crazy that's i that's that's saying that the state has greater ownership over your kids than you do that's right. like some truly creepy communist shit right and just like there are already on the conservative side which right there are already with the grooming there already are laws against indecent exposure in front of children that's already hella illegal just like that's already like very very illegal you get right. in huge trouble for that same goes for child abuse whether the child's being abused for being trans or not so there already are laws for these things but the government it plays on our fears, whether it's the Patriot Act or it's stuff like this. It plays on our fears. And then it gets more power and control over us. And it gets us to think that we're good people for supporting it. And really, we're giving up our own rights. Hmm. Um, talk about how we get past this kind of binary thinking. Um, you know, and, and you talk at various places about, you know, starting with something, you know, a point of agreement between people. Yeah. Um, yeah, what are some of the strategies that you use either in your daily life or in your professional life that we might broaden out to, you know, kind of change the way we interact with each other? Honestly, for me, I think a huge tool is vulnerability. Uh, it's something that I do throughout, not everything, that's how I live, but definitely throughout the book. I share a lot of deeply personal stories that uh, I definitely you know, haven't shared before. I talk about, I do talk in detail about the abusive relationship. I talk about struggles I've had with mental health. I talk, I mean, truly I give, I, I write, I print a piece of my diary from when I was having a full on mental breakdown. I talk about religion. I talk and, and in terms of how it has been difficult for me and my family sometimes um, with my now dead mother, specifically our relationship because she was very religious and I was not. So the complicated aspects yeah. of the relationship with my now dead mother. Um, I talk about my sexuality. I talk about my sex life. I talk about my vagina. I talk oh, about, wow. you know, my pet. I talk about all these things because in the hopes that other people feel open to share things about themselves because or, or to sh also share things about, about, your, their, especially about vagina. your vagina yeah, especially about my yeah. vagina yeah. yeah but I really truly think that if we want to start to see each other as human again we mm -hmm. have to be willing to show each other that right. we are human and I think that's really missing and it's a strategy that I've taken before even I mean I really try not to look at the Twitter stuff and sometimes it's like kind of funny and sometimes the Instagram comments are kind of funny but what I've done recently a few times if I see something really hateful I will privately dm the person because they always follow me and i say that hurt my feelings nine times out of ten the person's like oh i'm so sorry i didn't want to and i'm like you just called me an ugly bitch and told me to kill myself like, yeah. you, know, you know what i yeah. mean like how did you think that i would yeah. like that like yeah. you know um but i because they don't see you as a human being and mm -hmm. i think especially with social media that's also a thing and also I think that's such such a huge way because so much of what, you know, as humans, we have so much in common. Just because you have a disagreement on a political issue doesn't mean that you've never been through a similar kind of breakup or you might have a parent that's, you know, suffered from the same illness or you might have gotten arrested for the same thing or whatever. You can have something you can talk about with that person. Can, you know, part of it uh, in both in this book and, and the previous one, you also kind of talk about, uh, uh, you know, gaining more experience and growing vulnerability as part of it and maturation. You tell a pretty funny and a, a unflattering story when you met your husband, mm -hmm. who was a veteran, mm -hmm. yes. who served in Afghanistan, and you say, like, your opening line to him was something like, oh, you served in a useless war. Yes. <laughs> um, how did he respond to that? And did that kind of change the way that you, I mean, because that seems yeah. like both funny, but it is kind of like a, defen a defensive parry, right? Like you're negging him. Yes, almost. totally, because I didn't like, so my husband, I did not like him at all. So I, he's not my type. Like I yeah. like to date like creative types, um, you know, I, like musicians, actors, mm -hmm. especially like failed ones, losers, whatever. But yeah. creative losers was my type. <laughs> okay. And um, he was like a finance guy from a good job. He had a good job like and from he, a good he went family. To West went to West Point yeah. from Westchester. Went to boarding school. Conventionally attractive. I am, emotionally uh, stable, which I really had become used to the kind of pizzazz that an untreated mental illness can bring to a relationship. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I didn't want to go out with him at all, but my sister was going through the dating app with me, and she was like, Go, he's cute. Go out with him. And I was like, ew, he played lacrosse, like disgusting. <laughs> but 
I convinced, she convinced me to do it. So the first day he shows up and I look at him and I'm like disgusted because he's wearing his finance douche uniform, right? He's come straight from work. He has loafers on. I start coming up with excuses for why I needed to leave immediately, but none of them were working. So I was like, oh, whatever, I'll just get drunk. So I had yeah. five tequila sodas. <laughs> and he told me, yeah, he told me that he fought, went to Afghanistan. I was like, oh, you, you, you fought in a bullshit war. And he was like, as somebody who was over there, I agree. And he also was immediate. So he was immediately kind of fascinated with me because no girl has ever told. Usually that people just say, thank you for your service. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> he's never been had anyone, let alone someone he's meeting on a first date for the first time, say that the war that he fought in was good for nothing. Um, so he was intrigued by that. But I learned a lot because. Because and I, and I write a whole chapter about weaving in how my own biases were wrong mm -hmm. there twice, because at first I was kind of like, I don't know. I, I didn't know if I want to go on a second day with him or not, because I, I didn't really know he was fine. But I also got like I kissed him and left, but I was also like so drunk. So uh, but then I went out on a second date with him after canceling two dates and he showed up. He was dressed in like a hoodie. And he came late and he was unshaven. He had a hat. Oh, and you're like, this I is like, something I can I, work I was like, with. Oh, yeah. he's fucking hot. Yeah. <laughs> And then I actually never spent a night apart from him other than that. But I also, so I, so I, my biases were wrong there. If I would not have given him a chance, I would not be so happy now and have this stable life and like baby and all this other stuff that like actual normal, like well-adjusted people do. Um, but also I learned a lot about, you know, military. He, he, he kind of was saying, yeah, as someone who went over there, he was there at the tail end of when it was an actual combat mission. And he's like, I knew immediately being over there that what they were trying to say they were going to try to do was impossible. I mean, they wanted to create this sophisticated military force and teach them to use this equipment that required all this education across several different disciplines, but people here couldn't even read. I mean, he just he, it didn't make any sense to him to begin with. So I'm like, oh, you're a veteran, but you're very anti-war. Really, if I hadn't actually talked to him, I wouldn't have known that. You really, you really can't assume things from, from people without taking a risk of being very wrong. Um, can we talk about your libertarianism? Um, because on Fox, you are kind of the house libertarian yeah. now, right? Um, and where did, uh, where did that start from? And, um, how do you, how do you maintain that over time? Because a lot of, a lot of libertarians have kind of wandered off into strange areas, uh, over yeah. the past 10 or 20 years. They really have. Yeah. They really have. Yeah. I guess I've just always kind of been this yeah. way. And for me, I think that, what I've, I, look, I think that there's a misconception too where my view of something not being a problem that the government can solve doesn't mean that I don't think the thing is a problem. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the time people who are for small government, people who are libertarian get criticized as, oh, so you don't care if so people starve, you don't care if people die, you know, and it's like, it, it, come on. You know, I, I really think I, I, everybody cares about that, except for like the, the rare, true sociopath. Right. It's just more that I don't think the government's the best way to solve that. And look at how much that they control now. And they don't. I mean, living in New York, the amount that you pay in taxes is fucking insane. And what exactly do you get for it? Uh, well, I don't know the, what you get the for mayor it. just lit a you know, thousands of pounds of weed on fire. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. I, it's, and it's, we're getting new trash buckets. So, the, you know, yeah, it's, it's going buckets. somewhere. Yeah. So I always just, I always just go back to, is the government the way to hmm. solve this? Yeah. Let's look at what the num numbers here say. Let's look at what else they've touched. And I can't, mm -hmm. I, I'm never ending up at yes. Yeah. So that's, kind of where that comes from for me did i mean you you're from michigan you grew up there you went to hillsdale college um you know were your parents libertarian um or individualistic yeah or? my dad was my, my parents were libertarian my, or my dad's like is more libertarian i would say than anyone my mom was Conser they're both definitely small government, but my mom mm -hmm. was really religious, so she was conservative yeah. in that sense. But it was also really weird because if any, if you ever were to spend time around her, you would never know that she was extremely vulgar and mm -hmm. crass. Yeah, just like Jesus. Just, like well, true. <laughs> like, but like I am. Like we, had, yeah. we actually had the exact same personality oh, yeah. Yeah. with different beliefs. So we fought constantly. Yeah. We constantly, and it would just get yeah. vicious. She told me on her deathbed, she said, you were my favorite <laughs> sparring partner. <laughs> That's kind of like, beautiful. Thanks. Yeah. 
She also said, um, milk this as long as you can. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Because you, she was a fucking force, I will say that. You call yourself an agnostic, mm -hmm. not an atheist, yeah. but, and you were raised Catholic, but you're not a Catholic anymore. Mm -hmm. um, does religion matter, or how does it matter to you? I want to believe in something so bad, mm -hmm. you know? I want to think that I'm more than just this aging bag of bones and mm -hmm. blood who's just aging more and more and more until oh, yeah. one day I become completely decrepit and unfuckable. And then... <laughs> And then I'll turn I'm to seeing dust. My, I'm seeing my life flash before <laughs> yeah. my eyes. But, and then I'll turn and to I dust kind of forgot and where it's I all am. fucking yeah. over just like before I was yeah. born. I don't yeah. like that. Yeah. You know, and I don't like the thought of that. Yet and yet you but can't I can, make the but leap. But it's not a choice. That's yeah. the thing. And that's when sometimes religious people present it to me as like, mm -hmm. why don't you believe in God? And I'm like, you think I don't want to? No. You think that that your way of my mom, who I miss, is watching over me? And I can actually talk to her if I want. And I'm going to see her again in heaven where nothing will ever be wrong again. And, uh, you know, I, I, why would I not want to believe that if I could? I just can't get there. I hope someday I can have some kind of belief. I, I find like I yeah, but it's just it, I can't get there. I, I, and I also don't know how I can get there. Because how am I supposed to have all the answers to the question of the universe? I can't even hold a baby. Yeah. Um, speaking of babies and not getting there, um, let's talk about the election. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, when you look at Trump and Harris, you know, is one preferable or, or do you go screaming for Chase Oliver, the Libertarian Party? Or where do, where do you yeah. come down on them? You know, he doesn't follow me back. That is really, that's kind of a, I think that's saying something. Yeah, no. I'm kind of like, what the fuck, Chase? Yeah, yeah. Well, he's very busy. He's very <laughs> busy, yeah. I'm very busy. I have three <laughs> jobs and I'm growing a human. Um, but honestly, I've never voted for either major party and I don't intend to this time either. No. I just, I, I, I see it as if you are someone who is outright saying that I shouldn't have something that I think is a right, I'm not going to then vote for you to have power over me. For me, that feels like I'm being complicit in that. And also, I like to vote against the two-party system because I think it's responsible for a lot of the corruption that we have. Because whatever these politicians do, their own side's backing them up and defending it by just pointing out how what the other side did was so much worse. So it feels good for me to vote against it. What, um, what do you worry most about a second Trump presidency? I mean, just like going through it again. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just... The, the, I worry about, honestly, similar things regardless of who wins. I think that the past two elections, we've gotten to see how the other team handles it when they lose. And I, ha I haven't liked e either result. <laughs> <laughs> so can't, can we give them each participation trophies and then just not have a president or something? I mean, at this point, we, we, we don't have well, a president right yeah. now, yeah, do right. we? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. Like yeah. he, we don't like, like is, yeah. Like is any? When's the last time anybody thought about him? I'm struggling to remember. His yeah, name. exactly. Yeah. He's yeah. just like on the beach, which is fine. Like he should have been there for a while. Right. But we yeah, don't yeah. really have a president now. Yeah. And I don't want to say things are good, but they're not. But it's not. They're not falling off a cliff. Yeah, yeah. they're not as bad as you think they would be if there was a. No president. Is there, um, is there something about Harris particularly that worries you? I mean, I, in, I obviously I think that all like the, the, some of the ideas she's ha shared about economic policy are just totally horrifying and stupid. Such as? I mean, you know, price controls. <laughs> it's almost as if that's not the way to make things cheaper. Right. Uh, just as a ba I have like a basic understanding of economics. So I would say say that, but just in, in general, it's just, I've been so disgusted by, and this is, there's things that disgust me about every politician, so like, whatever. But with her specifically, and it's not just, it's, it's actually not about her so much as the way the machine has just rallied around her and she became the most popular icon it girl after she was kind of appointed the new nominee without ever even like talking to anyone first. It's so nauseating to me. Like Kamala is brat. It's like, isn't brat like doing cocaine in the summertime? Like, isn't what that is? Like she was, she was a prosecutor. Like she doesn't want you to do cocaine in the summertime. Like <laughs> she locked people up for weed. Yeah. 
you know? And it's just people creating these, the simping for politicians in general makes me sick. Cause when I see people see like when simps go, thank you. One person agrees. So when the, the simps go I off. I think in, that was Chase. With, yeah. yeah. With, when they go off in my comments, like, Oh, Cal, you're the most beautiful person in the world. Like, and some guy always comments like, hope she sees this bro. I feel that way sometimes when I see people talking about <laughs> politicians or fighting with their fam. Politics makes us fight with people who we actually know on behalf of people who don't even know we exist. That's simping and that's pathetic. Um, what is the one thing that we can take away from I used to like you until how binary thinking divides us that we can implement immediately when we go out into the other room and finish the food and drinks? That you should buy it. Okay. Um, buy the book. You That's should buy the book to, but to save the country. I will. Yes. I really do think that if everybody read this, read this book, it could save the country. I really do. Yeah. I think to take away is is just one single thing is does not tell you everything you need to know about a person. And in this book, I call myself out repeatedly for times I've done that and what I would have lost if I didn't realize it soon enough. And I, I, I really think that approaching people with a sense of curiosity rather than a sense of judgment is huge. And also, you really should buy the book. I'm having a baby. It's going to be expensive. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you, Kat Timp. Thank you for having me. Uh,